is his bank account. <coughs> then there was John Smith. He was a good, honest, kind-hearted soul, born and reared in the lower ranks of life and miraculously ignorant. He drove a team and owned a small ranch, a ranch that paid him a comfortable living. For although it yielded but little hay, what little it did yield was worth from 250 to $300 in gold per ton in the market. Presently, Smith traded a few acres of the ranch for a small undeveloped silver mine in Gold Hill. He opened the mine and built a little unpretending ten-stamp mill. Eighteen months afterward, he retired from the hay business, for his mining income had reached a most comfortable figure. Some people said it was 30000 a month, and others said it was 60000 Smith was very rich at any rate. Um, and, and then he went to Europe and traveled. And when he came back, he was never tired of telling about the fine hogs he had seen in England and the gorgeous sheep he had seen in Spain and the fine cattle he had noticed in the vicinity of Rome. He was full of the wonders of the old world and advised everybody to travel. He said a man never imagined what surprising things there were in the world till he had traveled. One day on board ship, the passengers made up a pool of $500, which was be to be the property of the man who should come nearest to guessing the run of the vessel for the next 24 hours. Next day, toward noon, the figures were all in the purser's hands, in sealed envelopes. Smith was serene and happy, for he had been bribing the engineer. But another party won the prize. Smith said, here, that won't do. He guessed two miles wider of the mark than I did. The purser said, Mr. Smith, you missed it further than any man on board. <laughs> we traveled 208 miles yesterday. <coughs> well, sir, said Smith, that just where I've got you, for I guessed 209. If you'll look at my figures again, you'll find a two and two O's which stands for 200, don't it? And after him, you find a 9. 2009, <laughs> which stands for 209. I reckon I'll take that money, if you please. <laughs> the Golden Curry claim comprised 1,200 feet, and it all belonged originally to the two men whose names bear it bears. Mr. Curry owned two-thirds of it, and he said that he sold it out for $2,500 in cash and an old plug horse that ate up his market value in hay and barley in 17 days by the watch. And he said that gold sold out for a pair of second-hand government blankets and a bottle of whiskey that killed nine men in three hours. <laughs> and, that, <laughs> and that an unoffending stranger that smelt the cork was disabled for life. <laughs> Four years afterward, the mine thus disp disposed of was worth in the in the San Francisco market seven million six hundred thousand dollars in gold coin. In the early days of poverty-stricken Mexican, a poverty-stricken Mexican who lived in a canyon directly back of Virginia City, had a stream of water as large as a man's wrist trickling from the hillside on his premises. The Ophir Company segregated a hundred feet of their mine and traded it to him for the stream of water. The hundred feet proved to be the richest part of the entire mine, four years after the swap, its market value, including its mill, was $1,500,000. An individual who owned 25 feet in the Ophir mine before its great riches was revealed to men, traded it for a horse, and a very sorry-looking brute he was, too. <laughs> A year or so afterward, when Ophir's stock went up to $3,000 a foot, this man, who had not a cent, used to say he was the most startling example of magnificence and misery the world had ever seen, because he was able to ride a $60,000 horse, yet could not escape, scrape up cash enough to buy a saddle, and was obliged to borrow one or ride bareback. He said if fortune were to give him another $60,000 horse, it would ruin him. <laughs> <laughs>
a youth of 19 who was a telegraph operator in Virginia on a salary of $100 a month, and who, when he could not make out German names in the list of San Francisco steamer arrivals, used to ingeniously select and supply substitutes for them out of an old Berlin city directory, made himself rich by watching the mining telegrams that passed through his hands and buying and selling stocks accordingly through a friend in San Francisco. Once, when a private dispatch was sent from Virginia announcing a rich strike in, the promin in a prominent mine and advising that the matter be kept secret till a large amount of the stock could be secured, he bought 40 feet of the stock at $20 a foot and afterwards sold half of it at $800 a foot and the rest at double that figure. Within three months, he was worth $150,000 and had resigned his telegraphic position. Another telegraph operator who had been discharged by the company for divulging the secrets of the office agreed with a moneyed man in San Francisco to furnish him the result of a great Virginia mining lawsuit within an hour after its private reception by the parties to it in San Francisco. For this, he was to have a large percentage of the profits on purchase and sales made on it by his fellow conspirator. So he went, disguised as a teamster, to a little wayside telegraph office in the mountains, got acquainted with the operator, and sat in the office day after day, smoking his pipe, complaining that his team was fagged out and unable to travel, and meantime listening to the dispatches as they passed clicking through the machine from Virginia. Finally, the private dispatch announced the, announcing the result of the lawsuit sped over the wires, and as soon as he heard it, he telegraphed his friend in San Francisco. I'm tired waiting, shall sell the team and go home. It was the signal agreed upon. The word waiting left out would have signified that the suit had gone the other way. The mock teamster's friend picked up a deal of the mining stock at low figures before the news became public and a fortune was the result. <clears throat> For a long time after one of the great Virginia mines had been incorporated, about 50 feet of the original location were still in the hands of a man who had never signed the incorporation papers. The stock became very valuable, and every effort was made to find this man, but he had disappeared. Once it was heard that he was in New York, and one or two speculators went east but failed to find him. Once the news came that he was in the Bermudas, and straight away, and straightway a speculator or two, or two hurried east and sailed for Bermuda, but he was not there. Finally, he was heard of in Mexico, and a friend of his, a barkeeper on a salary, scraped together a little money and sought him out. Bought his feet for a hundred dollars, returned and sold the property for seventy-five thousand. But why go on? The traditions of Silverland are filled with instances like these, and I would never get through enumerating them were I to attempt to do it. I only desired to give the reader an idea of a peculiarity of the flush times, which I could not present so strikingly in any other way, and which some mention of was necessary to a realizing comprehension of the time and the country. I was personally acquainted with the majority of the nabobs I have referred to, and so, for old acquaintance sake, I have shifted their occupations and experiences around in such a way as to keep the Pacific public from recognizing these once notorious men. No longer notorious, for the majority of them have drifted back into poverty and obscurity again. In Nevada, there used to be current the story of an adventure of two of her nabobs, which may or may not have occurred. I give it for what it is worth. Colonel Jim had seen somewhat of the world and knew more or less of its ways, but Colonel Jack was from the back settlements of the states, had led a life of arduous toil, and had never seen a city. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> These two, blessed with sudden wealth, projected a visit to New York. Colonel Jack to see the sights, and Colonel Jim to guard his unsophistication from misfortune. They reached San Francisco in the night and sailed in the morning. Arrived, arrived in New York, Colonel Jack said. I've heard tell of carriages all my life, 
and now I mean to have a ride in one. I don't care what it costs. Come along. They stepped out on the sidewalk, and Colonel Jim called a stylish barouche, but Colonel Jack said, No, sir, none of your cheap John turnouts for me. I'm here to have a good time, and money ain't any object. I mean to have the nobiest rig that's going. Now here comes the very trick. Stop that yaller one with the pictures on it. <laughs> Don't you fret. I'll stand all the expenses myself. So Colonel Jim stopped an empty omnibus, and they got in, said Colonel Jack. Ain't it gay, though? Oh, no, I reckon not. Cushions and windows and pictures till you can't rest. What would the boys say if they could see us cutting a swell like this in New York? <laughs> By George, I wish they could see us. <laughs> then he put his head out of the window and shouted to the driver, 